sure. The, yeah, I think that the population is too big for everybody to be afraid to stand up to the powers that be. So, I mean, I think in that situation, in the slowest thing, I think what we would normally you probably see is a lot of jury nullification start happening, at which point the government is either going to have to fall apart or increase the use of force. And so, I mean, the increasing use of force, you're going to provoke a large portion of the population. Welcome to the Art of Liberty, the unauthorized radical libertarian podcast with George Donnelly and John Tyner. If you want to maximize your freedom in the real world today, this is the podcast for you. Today is Monday, August 19th, 2013, and our topic is crime and punishment in the stateless society. Good morning, John. How are you today? How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm feeling good. Feeling good. Awesome. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm doing well this well my morning, this morning, actually. Of I, course, oh, I can't yeah. actually get those words out, so we'll see how well I'm actually doing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm moving tomorrow, so... I spent oh, the last so, few days packing everything up. So you've got a bunch of boxes and then your computer and monitor sitting there. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And an empty cabinet. Yeah. And uh, I, I threw away like 90% of my clothes. Well, I'm not, I'm not throwing them away. I'm going to donate them. Because yeah. about a year, about a year, year and a half ago, I, I did this special diet and I dropped 40 pounds. Oh, well, congratulations. <laughs> so... So none of my clothes, and then I didn't, I was like, darn, none of my clothes fit me, but I don't want to spend all that money on new clothes. <laughs> but yeah, so I held on to them forever. I'm so, surprised you're not getting more echo there with the bare walls and no furniture to eat up the sound waves. Yeah, oh, well, maybe it's, maybe the, all the boxes are absorbing it. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I've, I, I'm trying to lose weight off and on, but I've been doing it by going out and exercising for hours on end. And then it turns out that I'm so tired from the exercise that I eat a bunch of food to make up for it. And <laughs> I get in good shape, but don't really lose the weight kind of thing. <laughs> uh, I, the, only, the only images I've seen of you, you look pretty skinny. So, Yeah, everybody says that, but I'd like to lose a little more weight. Yeah. Well, you, you sit down to work all day. I mean, you work at a computer, right? I do, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I, I try to ride my bike a couple hours, you know, an hour every day, and I run about 10 miles a week. So, I get out and do stuff for at least an hour a day, but I like to eat also, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all of us do. Hey, I saw this this really interesting article on Reddit today. It says that uh, the Spanish government is attempting to um, tax solar power. Yeah. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> we so, like, tax if got, if the you, sun. If you got, yeah, that reminds. Isn't there some song with like the tax man? I I always thought it was like the Beatles or something, but I've never actually heard the song. Here comes but, the sun. Is that it? No, no, no. But it's actually no. There's one of it's called the tax man, I think. And it was. Oh yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, I can't remember. I, I should. I wish I had. Wish I'd know we were going to talk about this. I would have pulled it up. It's a pretty. It's got a, some pretty good lyrics to it. Uh. I can't remember how they go, and I don't want to butcher it. <laughs> but what they're talking about people with like solar panels on their roofs yeah yeah and so what is the reaction be uh ha what has the reaction been spaniards are tearing the solar panels off their roofs to avoid the new tax wow but aren't <laughs> they already paying taxes on other on like other forms of power uh probably yeah it seems I like a, it seems it seems like a more sane reaction would be to generate enough power to just take yourself off the grid so nobody can tell how much you're generating I and mean, i guess that will <laughs> do I think we talked a few months, like a month or two ago, about um, the guy in Maryland or Virginia who wanted to tax the rain. Oh, really? Yeah, I remember they that. Going, they were basically it was something like they were gonna. There was rain falling on the ground, and then there's runoff to into the city sewers, mm -hmm. and so they were gonna tax your property by the amount of rain that would fall on it. You know, because that's how much <laughs> runoff you're responsible for. Oh. <laughs> This sounds like a similar thing. Like they'll just fly over with the spy satellites and count the solar panels and then just send you a bill, I guess, based on that. See, sp spy panels, uh, spy uh, satellites are, you know, a, they're, they're an income producing asset. Yeah, it all comes, it's all about the money eventually, right? <laughs> yeah, it's just like, you know, this is just the latest. I mean, uh, I remember out, I think it was out in Colorado, they started uh, saying that, or maybe it was Oregon. That you could not collect rainwater um, 
on your property. You know, it you right. had to let it flow off. Yeah, and, that sounds like Oregon, I think, from what I remember. Oh yeah, and then um, and then in Bolivia, they said they they made us when they uh, published when they what they took they privatized all the the public utilities. They came up with something similar. And uh, because, like, the main city there in Bolivia is actually in a desert, if I remember correctly, if I'm not mistaken. And so it, like, seriously impacted people's lives. And then uh, the private, uh, the like, the European multinational that came in to take over the water uh, utility jacked up the prices radically. And so it was like a really direct attack on, on some really poor people, um, you know. And, I mean, it's happening everywhere. Yeah, can you can you see that they put those laws together? You're not allowed to catch the rain, but we're going to tax you for the runoff for not catching it. Yeah, government I mean, basically geez. sticks you in a catch twenty two and then charges you for their catch twenty two. Yeah, and speaking it's, of catch, go ahead. I don't understand. I don't understand how. I mean, it's just shameless, you know, on the government's part. I mean, I can't believe somebody comes up with this stuff and then doesn't. I don't know how they can live with themselves or even sleep at night. I mean, I literally don't. I mean, you know, that that's kind of a cliche that's overused, but I really, I don't, I can't even fathom how somebody could put those two laws together and then sleep at night. <laughs> well, they probably come from different agencies. <laughs> yeah, I suppose, but <laughs> you know, it's somebody's like, got to somebody's got to be far enough away from it to see the stupidity. <laughs> yeah, it, but it's you know, it's like you never know if government is actually a conspiracy or if it's just a bunch of really stupid people who are out of control. You know, yeah, I, I tend I tend to view it as the latter most of the time. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But so you're going to say something about a catch twenty two though that I interrupted you. So Lava Bit is that company that um, a week or so ago they the government wanted something from them, and instead of giving it to them, they decided we're shutting down because we consider what the government wants to be to be a crime. Yeah, good for him. Was now he was he in Texas or was he outside the country? Like I thought I saw something about Texas, but when you and I talked before, I got the impression he was outside the country. No, I'm pretty sure he. Well, at least his business was based out of Texas, and I okay. I know that for sure. And then I read something that he, like it was it was like that he lived nearby or something. I, I'm not oh. sure though, but I'm pretty okay. sure anyway. he himself is in the United States. Okay, all right. Sorry to derail the conversation. <laughs> not at all, unless he's fled. <laughs> Yeah. No, no, no. Well, I don't know anything about that. I just I got the impression maybe it was just the guy's name that because isn't his name like Lars or something like that or Ladar or something. Yeah, it was something that sounded foreign to me. I thought he was maybe like living in the Netherlands or somewhere up there for some mm. reason. But maybe yeah. I was confused about something else. Never mind. If I was him, though, I might be looking to move. <laughs> yeah. Don't go to Hong Kong or Moscow. Yeah. So basically, they are saying that by shutting down his business, he, he may have committed a crime in their eyes and that he may be subject to arrest, if you can Just believe that. Just by shutting down, not, not necessarily for coming out and saying why he shut down. Right, right. Wow. Pretty so intense, now it, huh? Now it's, now, now it's the, if you want to run your business, we're going to tell you how to run it by regulating it. And then not only that, you can't shut it down. Uh, yeah, I mean, that that's like straight out of Atlas Shrugged, isn't it? it is it? I Well, I don't oh, know. Oh, that's like, right. You, you always talk about it. that, and I still haven't read it. <laughs> they yeah, actually they were... had a book exchange at my office, and I was like, and so I saw it there, and I was like, I should grab that. And right about the time I was going to do it, it was gone. Uh, yeah, and Atlas Shrugged, at, at near the end of the, the story, the government passes a law saying that um, everybody has to stay in their current jobs. All the current businesses have to stay open. They can't produce uh, either more, neither more, nor less than they produced last year. Like everything absolutely must stay the same, you know? Uh, <laughs> I, I need to read this book. <laughs> For a long time, I had this thing where people were talking about movies and I would just go out and watch them just because I wanted to know what the pop culture references were. Mm. But. Seems like now I need to start reading some Ayn Rand, so I'll get the libertarian reference. <laughs> well, the, I'll tell you, the book ha definitely has it's it sustained my interest, even though it's really long. But it does have this one part, like this sixty page, and it's small type, <laughs> sixty page <laughs> speech, which uh, which I read, but uh, other people have told me they've skipped. So, now, is it, this is oh that was okay. Yeah, sorry, I missed what I missed. 
I missed a word in there, and I thought I'd pick it back up. You were talking about the speech. Yes, that's the part I've always heard referred to as well. Oh, yeah. And I was like, oh, this speech is so boring, and I can't stand it, and it ruins the whole book. <laughs> I thought the speech was pretty good because finally it was like something remotely resembling nonfiction philosophy stuff as opposed yeah. to the fictional stuff. Yeah, it seemed to me most people's complaint about it is that it just goes on for 60 pages. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty insane, yeah. Yeah. Hey, so we mentioned my brother's uh, my brother-in-law last week. Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of talked about arbitration. And I think we went in a direction that he wasn't really talking about or not necessarily had implied when uh, when he wrote his question to me, which seems like a th very easy thing to do when people ask you questions. Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, we kind of went off in the arbitration thing. And, you know, what do you do if you've got a problem with somebody like do you ta how you take them to court kind of thing? Mm -hmm. And he wrote me out again, wrote me again afterwards. And it turned out his question was really if you get arrested by the government um why would you even participate in the proceedings like why would you talk to a lawyer why would you talk to the judge and that was actually his question do you mean like in a stateless society why would you participate no he mean, no no he's talking about like under the current system kind of you know if you should not talk to a lawyer not talk to a judge as some form of protest you know if you really disagree with this system why participate in it in any way shape or form so that they don't send you to prison for many years <laughs> Well, yeah, and that, and that was his, that was his thing too. Is he even wrote? He said, "I know the answer. It's you don't want to, you know, you don't you want to protect whatever freedom you have might be left by not getting sent to jail." But he was just kind of like, "If you really disagree with this system, you should try not to participate in it," kind of thing. Well, that, that's that's a common first reaction, and I certainly had that reaction as well. And one can even carry that to the, the extreme of pretending like the government doesn't even exist and going about one's life. Uh, as if one already had one's complete freedom. But the fact is that, that there is a big band of uh, criminals out there. And, you know, if you cross their lines, uh, you know, you're taking your your fate into your own hands because uh, they can uh, tase you, they can beat you, they can render you, uh, you know, uh, a vegetable, they can render you brain dead or just plain dead. If if they don't put you into a cage for some time, you know, and in the cage, people get hurt in the cage, people get terrorized, people get raped, all kinds of crazy things, uh, you know. So like once you enter into the the police sphere, it's like you're not in control anymore, and uh, nobody likes that feeling. Yeah, and I I've had a I've had discussions with him along similar lines before, and one of the things I told him before, or at least was kind of headed down the path of, was that I don't even think that the state is so much the problem. It's that they have the tacit approval of the bulk of the population. Hmm. I mean, if the population walked away, the state basically ceases to exist. Um, maybe, maybe I don't think we there really is any easy answer with these things. You know, everybody says, "Well, we just have to educate." If everybody was just educated, you know. And then somebody else says, well, we just have to disobey. And if everybody just disobeyed and then somebody else says, well, we just have to withdraw. And somebody else says, well, we just all have to stop paying taxes or stop, um, you know, whatever. Well, and I think and those I, are all I think those are all right. If you could get everybody to do any one of those things, I think you'd be fine. I think it's kind of a, a false, um, you know, like a false hope there because I, I – it's first of all getting everybody in the world to do something is like impossible. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm and not second saying of it's all, the way to get it done. I'm saying if you could get it done, any one of those I think would solve the problem. And second of all, even if you get everybody, let's say you get everybody to accept the non-aggression principle, for example. Well, we could all still lack the courage to actually stand up to the people in power. The ones who have the guns and the tanks and the helicopters and stuff. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, I, I'm not sure. That, yeah, I think that the population's too big for everybody to be afraid to stand up to the powers that be. So, I mean, I think in that situation, in the slowest thing, right, I think what we would normally you probably see is a lot of jury nullification start happening. At which point, the government is either going to have to fall apart or increase the use of force. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, the increasing use of force, you're going to provoke a large portion of the population. I don't know. 
you know, people, people, I always see people talking about how, you know, you're going to ease up on us or we're going to do X, Y, and Z, you know, and we will rise up and we will defeat you. We will crush you but again, our I boots, think, you I know, think... and it's like, it's all like, it's, it's just a fantasy really. Right. And I think that's because those people somewhere in the back of their mind know that the state still has the approval of the bulk of the population. But you know, that those kind of things, those kind of like those revolutions kind of thing, everybody talks about them. But I think that when they finally happen, it's more organic. Somebody doesn't just get out there and grab a gun and call up his neighbors and be like, all right, it's time to go. Mm-hmm. You know, those things just kind of sprout up. And then when they sprout up, that's the time that they have any chance of ca- taking hold. Well, and, and in that sense, Egypt is is really interesting uh, as an outsider. I think for somebody who's in Egypt, it's pretty frightening. <laughs> Right, but as an outsider, it's it's interesting to observe how that whole thing has played out, and it it hasn't been quick. I mean, it, it's been like two years now, right? Well, it seems like it's gone through a number of iterations. You know, it it happened once, and they installed a new government, and then they decided, oh, we don't like this government, and it kind of happened again. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, and it's it seems like we talked about this a month or two ago, and it seems like kind of what we talked about is starting to come true. You know, where the military is kind of like, you know, what we don't want to have to step in every time the people put some leader in charge and they don't like him. We're just going to do it ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I mean I, that I was kind of the that was kind of the direction we went in. You know, or at least some that was what I was saying at the oh, time. Oh right, was, yeah, no, I one, remember. I just it I seems just like didn't see president. anything about that happening now. Oh yeah, the military has been cracking down hard on these people. But I thought they were cracking down on the the Muslim Brotherhood type. Well, it's just, I mean, you know, basically it seems like the the military deposed the this Muslim Brotherhood guy and essentially are running the the state right now. Mm. And I think they even reimposed this quote unquote state of emergency so that they could, you know, disregard a bunch of the laws. Hmm. So it's not clear to me that it's going to that they're going to eventually relinquish power like they did the last time again. Well, I, I saw uh, in the news this morning that uh, they're letting Hosni Mubarak out of jail, <laughs> if you can believe that. Well, I'm sure the United States applied pressure to somebody. That, that, that adds a lot of, uh, a lot of powder to, the, to this keg, I think. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was very interesting. I saw something where the United States has been loath to declare um, – Mohammed Morsi being deposed as a coup. And so I finally read an article somewhere that said that if the government declares that a coup, then the billion and a half or so dollars of foreign aid that flow over to Egypt from the U.S. every year have to stop. Hmm. And so that's basically why they don't want to do it is because then the foreign aid stops and then the control or what level of control the U.S. can exercise over Egypt basically, you know, goes away. Wow. But that, I think Egypt, you know, I think all the people, uh, you know, who always say, you know, we've got to pick up our gun and start shooting him, you know, uh, that's like they should look at Egypt and look at how nasty that's getting, you know, as soon as the guns came out, you know, I think and it seems like they came out, you know, by, by the uh, by the it was the Muslim, the Muslim Brotherhood people that pulled out the guns. Um, but that could be war propaganda. But it seems like, uh, you know, it's got it got really ugly once the guns got involved. Yeah, well, I think it always does. <laughs> yeah, but, so but I've seen are... a number of I've seen a number of uh, quotes over the years about how revolutions are messy. Well, yeah, I mean, at least armed ones. That's... Yeah, I mean, I would I would imagine they all are. Well, actually, I um, well, yeah, but they're, I think the armed con- ones to a greater sen- extent. In, in, I mean, in this, especially in the sense that they're not really controllable. But if you if you look, for example, take an example when the um, you know the people power revolutions in the Philippines, those uh, you know when they knocked different leaders out of power, those were weren't that bad. Uh, they were you know, like everybody got together, millions of people, you know, in central squares and stuff, and they made stuff happen, and there wasn't that much violence. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to admit that I don't know anything about any of that. <laughs> and there was a there was a singing revolution in somewhere in Eastern Europe, I remember, that was pretty yeah. effective. Um, but yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have anything to say about any of that stuff. I have, I'm, unfortunately, I have to admit I'm not very knowledgeable about the, those those revolutions. I, I study and, that stuff that as, history. as like a hobby. It's like a big hobby. There's this um, this guy in Boston. He runs the uh, 
the Albert Einstein Institute or something for peace. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he's, he, he put out this little pamphlet called 98 or no, 198 methods for nonviolent action, a gene something. They're making a movie about him. Uh -huh. Um, and it's been really interesting. He's written books about, about nonviolence, uh, and apparently yeah, about nonviolence as a tactic for these kinds of things. And apparently he has partially inspired some of the Arab spring stuff. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Maybe they should give that guy some kind of Nobel peace prize. <laughs> no, sorry. That's, no. that's for Obama. Yeah. Oh uh, Yeah. <laughs> well, I saw I saw they've been talking about, or at least seen uh, Bradley Manning's name being thrown around for a Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah, I, you know Obama should really give his to him. Yeah, no kidding. Well, Obama should give it to just about anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> hey, did you see that WikiLeaks came out with their insurance files? I saw you. Yeah. I mean, they did this like a year or so ago too, right? I mean, it was a much smaller file, I think, at the time. Mm, yeah, yeah, I remember they did it before. But yeah, I saw some. I saw some article yesterday or the day before where yeah, they encrypted like huge amounts. Like I saw like they released some like almost half a terabyte file. Half a terabyte, yeah, yeah. There was one yeah, file like was three hundred forty nine gigabytes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Must yeah, be some so some serious video in there, I think. Yeah, or or like some people have suggested, somebody ju they just put in a bunch of random data and are claiming that <laughs> it's encrypted secrets. <sighs> Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't think WikiLeaks would do that because they have, you know, a certain level of credibility and influence right now. And it seems like it might be something to get them to back off of Bradley Manning and not give him, you know, 80 years or 90 years in prison. But the most likely thing is that they're going to give Bradley Manning a pretty serious sentence. And so then, yeah. then WikiLeaks, you know, you would think would be compelled to release their insurance files. Yeah, my my, you know, I I tend to think that they've got that kind of stuff, but on the other hand, I kind of think if their whole deal is to release this kind of stuff, why why haven't they released this stuff? Mm. Or are they, you know, are they kind of operating kind of through, you know, secret channels and stuff basically telling the government kind of behind the scenes, we've got this stuff, you know, and we're not going to release it, but you better, you know, kind of is something going on behind the scenes or what? Maybe it seems that seems like a like a real high stakes game of uh, brinkmanship there because it very much does. I mean, like I said, it it wouldn't surprise me if they were bluffing, just like you said. I mean, they've got this credibility, so they could put out this huge file, and there's a very real possibility. I mean, you know that that is real. I I don't know. I mean, that seems like a lot of data. Yeah, and you know, like you said, if it's high quality video, it would certainly it would certainly eat up that much space very quickly. Mm. But it was a couple of years ago, a similar criticism was made of them when they were um, like, uh, you know, releasing every day, a few, maybe 20 or 30, 50 new um, files from the Brad that supposedly Branding Ma Bradley Manning had leaked out uh, right. the state department memos or whatever. And people yeah. were like, you know, just release this stuff. Stop piddling it out every day. Just, just release it already. Well, that I understood because they were supposedly going through it and redacting information that they didn't think, you know, was in the public interest kind of thing, like people's names, people whose lives might be put in danger by having that information released. I mean, that made sense. This just seems like it's some huge file, and they're not saying, you know, we're working on this or anything. They're basically like, this is going to be some kind of indiscriminate data dump if somebody does something. But it, it's not even clear to me that they've made the threat yet. They just put this file out there. Mm. You know, like basically putting the file out there is the threat. Yeah. Um, Maybe they want to keep the government guessing. That could be. I wouldn't be surprised. Mm -hmm. On that topic, you saw Branley Madney, Manning had to make a statement this week. No, I missed that. Yeah, he, um, you know, at his sentencing, the sentencing portion of his trial, he came out and made a statement. Um, what, what did he say? He basically said, I know I did wrong. I'm very sorry. <sighs> oh, right. I remember all now. All kinds of stuff about that. And, you know, for all the talk, you know, 1984 gets about surveillance and that kind of stuff i thought this was the most compelling parallel between 1984 and real life ah uh, yeah you make a good point there I, I remember that now yeah he basically was like you know i mean he I, I know i hurt people i know i did wrong i know i should have worked within the system yeah you know working within the system is a big deal inside the federal government it, oh yeah i mean it kind never of worked but <laughs> 
it's curious how how much of a big deal they make of that. Like with Adam Kokesh, they they've they've made a big deal of whether or not he's going to work within the system or not. In what and, way? Um, you because like, you know whether you it's going to be an armed revolution. Yeah, whether he's like for an armed revolution or whether he's going to run for office, you know that kind of a thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I just, you know, I thought that that was, I thought this, like I said, most people, and even I was the same way. I mean, I knew what 1984 was about, uh, the book, you know, and how it was just all about surveillance and you couldn't get away from the state kind of thing. Um, But basically towards the end, um, when they finally catch the main character and basically, you know, torture him to the point where he becomes, you know, a member of the state and, you know, wholeheartedly wants to go along with it and... I'm not saying Bradley Manning feels that way, but at least publicly the way this statement reads, that's exactly how it sounds. Right. I remember that part. And and that's kind of scary. Um, it is. And that that's and that's why I wish, you know, more people read the book so that they knew it wasn't just about surveillance. I mean, this is what it's this is ultimately what it's about. About like brainwashing. Making every yeah, yeah, basically, you know, not just not just killing people who dissent, but you know, turning them to the point where they don't, they don't even want to dissent anymore. Killing you know, the no dissent dis- in the person. Right. Yeah. Not just killing the person, killing the dissent itself. Yeah. Yeah. Scary. I mean, it's, it's a scary thing if you've read the book and then see this thing, I think. Although, yeah. And somebody, I saw somebody posted something criticizing him like, Hey, he's sold out. And I was like, you know, you try enduring years of the kind of torture and, uh, you know, isolation that he's endured. And to start off, he doesn't seem like he has a very strong uh, personality, and then and then you know face ninety years in prison, and and not be like, hey, you know, I'll say whatever you want, just like yeah, and what it's been like know. three years in basically solitary confinement, you know, and on top of that, being humiliated by being forced to you know stand naked in his cell and that kind of thing too. Yeah, yeah, that went you know, on I'm not for sure. quite a while. Yeah, I mean, I like to think I could endure that, but you know, I I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't claim that I am. Mm, so, I don't I'm know. not sure anybody I'm not sure anybody's strong enough to stand up that for you know extended periods of time like he has. Or yeah, like he's had to go through at least. So yeah, I certainly don't fault him for making the statement. I just think you know, looking at it as an outside observer, it's all very scary to me. It is very 1984ish. Yeah. Hmm. Just yeah. 30 and years then, late. Yeah, and then kind of related to that, you saw Glenn Greenwald starting to or has drawn the ire of the state. They're overtly, uh, per, or, uh, I, want to, I don't want to say persecuting him, but I think that's probably the most fitting word for it. Yeah, I saw the uh, the his partner. He um, he's gay, so he he has a partner, not a wife or or anything. Right. Um, so his partner is apparently helping him with some of this this journalistic work. And yeah, I thought that was an underreported part of this story yeah, so far. Yeah. And I just caught one little paragraph where it turns out he was actually working for the Guardian and the Guardian paid for this trip. Yeah. They admitted that in their article, but they um, did, but it was one little paragraph and the rest of the story is kind of written as oh they're they're persecuting Glenn's family. You mm-hmm. know, and the entire article I read by Glenn Greenwald never mentioned it and he was like, They're going after my family. Yeah, I think the Guardian so, is a little too close to it. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to beat that or belabor that point, but I thought that that was kind of underreported and in both articles. But the thing that was really uh, like a wow moment for me is that they have this law in the UK where they can not just uh, at a port where they can not just well, sorry, there's law that permits them to at ports uh, not just hold you for a maximum of nine hours, but also. Once they say they're holding you under this law, if you don't start cooperating completely, you know, if you're not completely free and easy with your the answers to their questions, that is an is a crime. Yeah, you you don't get you don't have an automatic right to an attorney, and it's illegal to not cooperate. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. this thought, is the I UK. Thought, yeah, yeah. I thought. Well, and the other thing I thought was interesting too is that you don't have to be coming into or leaving that airport like you could be passing through I mean, so in this case in this case i guess he was um david miranda he was flying from uh berlin to brazil and oh really passing through Heathrow. yeah 
which was kind of interesting because I mean Edward Snowden is basically or he was living in the Moscow airport and those are kind of supposed to be like stateless enclaves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean that's the reason you can get away with living in an airport for you know uh, you know without the law applying to you kind of thing. Yeah. Kind of interesting also that the state would create that's different states would create these stateless enclaves. Yeah, and it's well, it seems like they're they're politically stateless enclaves. Like there become some kind of mechanism for states to kind of fight with each other. But I mean, if you commit a murder in there, somebody's going to come in and stop you. I guarantee it. <laughs> mm, yeah, I don't know if that's like port police or like you know private police that deal with that kind of stuff. I don't really know how it works, but it seems like it's it seems like it's less of a um, written regulation than kind of just a gentleman's agreement under use the term gentleman loosely in this, <laughs> in this context, but it seems like it's sort of a gentleman's agreement between states that that's just kind of the way the airports operate. Yeah. And, and uh, I also saw in the Guardian article that the, the government is considering reducing the nine hour maximum to a six hour maximum. Yeah. So they've chosen a They've, they've taken an arbitrary number and arbitrarily made it smaller to choose some or other arbitrary number. Yeah. But I, I think that, you know, people in the United Kingdom should go figure out who is pushing for that six hour reduction and then yeah. just go vote for him because this guy, <laughs> no. just, let's just go no, vote. No, for you this can't, guy. you can't, no, don't vote. Let's for anybody. send them some you donations. Can't. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Well, I thought you were serious there for a second. <laughs> But that, that status, we were... that, that's the kind of thinking that gets people into voting. Like, hey, I have Tyrant A, and he's a real ass. And here's Tyrant B. <laughs> and he sounds... He's slightly less. <laughs> yeah, he, he says, like, he says, he talks my walk. And then, and then he, like, he, he promises... He talks a little more my walk than the other guy. Yeah, and then he, he promises some to be less of an asshole. So let's, let's go vote for that guy in droves. You know, let's give that guy more power... And and let's donate to him, and let's organize a whole national organization around him. You know, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm st- I'm still calming down because I was spinning up thinking we were going to get into an argument about voting. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were serious when you said that, and I'm still trying to calm down from <laughs> yes <laughs> from that. <laughs> uh, but that's the logic of people who vote. But anyway, I didn't mean to get us off on that topic. No, that's all right. I was I was out somewhere the other day and um I met somebody. I met my it was a friend. My wife knows this lady and her husband I guess is a libertarian. And mm-hmm. I've never met him and so um I met him and a friend of mine had known. Him. And anyway, this friend of mine introduces the two of us and he's like, "Oh, like you're this libertarian, like you're the TSA guy." And I was like, "Oh, yeah, I'm him." Yeah. And he's like, "Oh, what do you think about Rand Paul?" And I kind of like I didn't roll my eyes, but I was kind of like, oh, I don't know. Like, I, you know, and basically what I told him was like, you know, I just don't really care for the government in general. Hmm. And he was, he was just like really taken aback. Like, oh, you know, and I was like, <laughs> I was like, well, Rand Paul is like, he's not as bad as the rest of the guys. You know, I was like, I didn't want to completely crush this guy's spirit, but. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't tell him you're an anarchist, huh? No, I didn't. I try, I generally try not. I don't know why, but people are scared of that phrase. So I generally try not to use that. At least certainly not on the first time I meet them. Mm, yeah, I can understand that. Although <laughs> I, I love, I love the throat in people's faces. Yeah. Just to, I mean, just yeah, for the shock factor and just to be like, you know, to avoid the whole, <clears throat> you know, that the whole intermediate phase, you know, so like, you know, what do you think of this? I'm an anarchist. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I, I, I don't think there should be any government, you know? Yeah. So like, just, just to avoid that whole intermediate, you know, what, you know, do you like this part of the government? Do you like that politician? Do you like that? You know, just, no, I don't like getting it done. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I try, I try to take a slight, a slightly less direct approach with that at least. Uh, more diplomatic. Yeah, slightly. Yeah, somebody, <laughs> somebody was. I've, I've seen it referred to um, in talking about gun laws. You know, people were asking, you know, when are we going to get this assault weapons ban um, repealed in California? And somebody wrote back and basically said, "That's like asking a girl if she's into anal sex on the first date. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you don't go straight for the gusto on the first date." <laughs> like, so, I mean, that, I hope that's not too vulgar for our audience, but I think it was apropos here. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. That, I mean, there are two, two approaches, right? There's the approach where, you know, let's take baby steps and little by little. And then there's the approach where, nah, screw that. You know, 
freedom now, you know? Yeah, I think I think you might you might gain more traction by calling your yourself a voluntarist at least in the beginning. And I think most people would tend to agree that voluntary interactions is they would agree with that idea. You know, though, I see a lot of voluntarists spinning their wheels, you know, with the word voluntary, and it's just like, guys, it's voluntary. It's voluntary, voluntary, voluntarist, voluntary, voluntarism, voluntary, vo- guys, voluntary, <laughs> and it. I don't see them making that much progress with that. Well, I think, I, I think that's a good way to start, though, because I think most people, without realizing what voluntarism entails, would agree that, you know, interactions between people should be voluntary. And I think at least that, that's at least a way to get in and start. You know, though, I like what the gun people have done, especially with the, the, the recent round of... Um, you know, that British guy on TV and demanding, you know, and Here's the, Morgan. Yeah, that guy. And, you know, the Newtown shooting and, you know, we got to have more gun control. And, and and so the gun people are like, no, no and no, you know. And uh, and I so I think and I, that kind of hard line thing where it's like, you know, you try to take my guns and F you. No way. I'm going to shoot you. You know, whatever. So yeah, that, I think that. that- that's got a lot to do with the NRA kind of organizing those people, I think. I don't know. I don't. This seems too hard line for the NRA, frankly. But well, I, think, I mean, I think the NRA's got a huge constituency. It's it's and a lot of times the NRA can flex their muscle just because they know that you know or, you know the other side, the government or you know anti gun people know the NRA's got a huge constituency behind it that votes. Mm-hmm. But I think that you know instead of like. Like there's two ways to approach the gun issue. You could say, but I need my gun because, you know, I need it for self-defense and it's just a gun. It's just a tool. It's like I go out sporting with it. And then there's the other one. It's like, F you, forget about it. It's my gun. You just try and come and take it, you know? Yeah, you want it, you come and get it. (laughs) And I think that more radical approach has been more successful. You, You saw more of it after the Newtown thing. And I think that it effectively shut down the calls for gun control because I think that it was – people were a little bit shocked by how forceful it was. And so that I think that you know, taking a stand, a controversial stand is more attention-grabbing and it's going to generate more respect than somebody who's, who, who takes the – to try to reason with you and come on, see, you know, see, really, I'm right, you know, like it, like being out there and being a tough guy and a badass and be like, you know, you cross, I'm not, you cross this line and, and it's done, you know, you're done, you know, like that, that, that generates more respect. So they need to be less milk toasty, as you would say. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I think, badass. yeah, I think the way forward is for us to be like, to put our stuff into practice. And when people are like, mm, but who will build the roads? You're like, fuck you. I'm building them right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? I don't know why, but there's something funny about when people say fuck you out of nowhere. <laughs> um, sometimes. We're going to have to get the NC-17 rating on this episode. <laughs> yeah, between, between your uncharacteristic thing and, uh, <laughs> and me. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? Oh, nothing. I was just going to say, like, we're going to have to do these episodes where we don't pick a topic more often. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that, yeah, I think that, you know, it's, it's the, 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 the point has come where, you know, we have to put our stuff into, into action and we have to just move forward. And if somebody blocks our way, we just have to keep moving. And if they won't move, we'll just push them out of the way and just keep going. No, no, we're not. We're non-aggression. We're non-aggressive. We are, but that's not aggression. That's like, hey, I'm walking this way, and the guy's like getting in my way, and I'm like, well, you know, you're getting in my way, you know. So just step aside. <laughs> Is that the? I'm I'm moving my fist here. Don't if you get out of the way. It's your fault. Uh, no, but I'm not talking about throwing punches. <laughs> well, I'm just saying it's the same kind of idea, just at a. At a larger level, but even gun. No, I I understand you're talking. You're not talking about a physical, a phys- in a physical way, I suppose. Maybe, but you even have you <laughs> seen the Gandhi movie? Uh, no. Oh my gosh. Oh, you haven't read Iran. Have- you haven't seen the Gandhi movie. 
I was gonna say you need to send me a list of libertarian <laughs> libertarian works that I need to that I need to consume. But, but in in early on in the Gandhi movie, there's a scene where they organize themselves in in columns and they walk up to this facility that they, they want to get into, and they just they just walk right up to the guards. You know, it's like they're not like, hey, can you get out of the way? They're just like walking <laughs> right into the guards, and it's just not walk a, past them. Well, no, they were walking right into them because the guards were blocking them, and it wasn't okay. aggressive at all. And I don't—they I, they probably didn't even make contact with the guards because the guards were armed with uh, with big batons and they, you know, cracked heads and stuff. But but I mean, that's the kind of thing that we have to do. We have to be like, okay, this is our truth, and we're 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 making our truth real, and we're moving forward. And if you want to crack my head open because of that, well, that's your call. But I'm still going. You know, doesn't doesn't bumping into the guard isn't that aggressive? I don't think so. I'm assuming the guard stands there and then this other guy bumps into him. I don't think so. No, because the guard shouldn't be there. Mm, Not sure. (laughs) Not sure that's a valid that's a valid defense there. (laughs) So if if there's but so let's see, there's a government facility, and there's a guard who won't let you in. The government facility is supposed to be the property of everybody, right? Because government I'm, property I'm, is public property. I'm, I'm I'm starting to follow now. So in in theory, I, well, but I guess then the guard has an equal right to be there that these people do. But so he doesn't just, have the right to deny me entry because it belongs to both of us. I suppose, but to the extent that he to the extent that he's standing there and you don't walk around him. But if, if, if he has a rank – no, but if – I mean if I can walk around them, I'll walk around them. But if there are 20 guards and they're completely blocking off the entrance, then – Yeah, then I'm with you. OK. <laughs> but if there's just one guard, John's going home. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean if, there's still an argument to be made there I guess I suppose. I mean what if it's not guards? What if it's other, other people who decide to prevent you from getting in there? I mean it's – They're still preventing me. It's I mine. Guess. It's just as much it is as it is theirs. Yeah. Maybe we, maybe we need some arbitration service to sort this out for us. Ah. Uh, it's interesting <laughs> because it's like I'm, I'm advocating Gandhian stuff and you're like, whoa, that's too violent for me. <laughs> well, you're talking about two people <laughs> physically interacting with each other. And, it, and I'm assuming that at least one of them isn't interested in voluntarily – undertaking this interaction uh, but the, do you see the irony though yeah i do I'm just... <laughs> this isn't peaceful enough for me oh uh, <laughs> so hey dude we had a question on facebook right uh yeah we did do you want to try and tag yeah sure yeah, let's tackle read it. it yeah okay. i think we have so... about 15 minutes left maybe we can tackle it in that time all right, let's solve the world's problem in 15 minutes. Everybody get ready for this. Here we go. All right, start the clock. All right, so he, he writes, In a stateless society, how would criminals be dealt with? Not people who commit victimless crimes, but rather the serial killers slash seriously deranged. What would the process look like for taking away someone's freedom or their life without a state to pass down the punishment? Hmm. This came from a gentleman named Luke Apps. Hmm. Great question, Luke. Thank you. Although I wish oh. you had called and, and, and recorded it because it is it is a podcast, so we like to hear audio. Maybe he'll ask us another question later, or maybe we'll so severely butcher this one that he'll have to rephrase it. Ah, that's good. That's a good plan. <laughs> Let's answer a different question so he has to call in and correct us. <laughs> <laughs> we'll probably do that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and we did it last week with my brother-in-laws, right? Yeah. So, uh, first of all, I think that there will be, um, you know, there will be guys who are like police. They'll be just more accountable and they'll be, you know, in competition and whatnot. It won't be a monopoly. And so, uh, you know, let's assume this guy is apprehended by police and they'll do their forensics and they'll um, prove that he, um, you know, they'll collect enough evidence to show that he is, let's say he's guilty of, of, uh, I don't know, murder, shall so, we say? Well, let me, let me ask yeah. you this before you go too much further. Mm-hmm. So you, you think they'd apprehend him before he's convicted of anything? Absolutely. Really? Yeah, sure. But isn't he innocent until proven guilty? Yes. Mm-hmm. So then how does he get apprehended? I mean, aren't you, aren't you removing his, some of his rights by 
holding him somewhere against his will, presumably? Well, l- I mean, let's say they find him at the scene of the crime. Well, that's something different. Then, then I'm with you. I mean, if you you know you get there, you show up, and the guy's got a knife in his hand or whatever, and standing over a bloody body. Mm-hmm. There's there's very few other conclusions you can draw from that. Well, I, I would imagine that um, you know a good ins- a decent insurance company, you know, and this is com- of, of course complete speculation, written into the agreement with them and or with the the, the defense agency is. You know that they can come and and uh, you know let's say that the murder was committed and then it was done and then you know they researched you know and did forensic and they're like okay this is the guy um, you know I would imagine that, that that person would have given them the right to apprehend them uh, should you know they have an overwhelming amount of evidence who who gave them the right the guy who who committed the, the criminal crime. himself you mean yeah mm-hmm. So I, I mean, I, I would agree with you, but I would also I would also suggest that perhaps he wouldn't have signed up with any kind of insurance company. But if he hadn't signed up with an insurance company, how did he get access? You know, how did he leave his house, or how did he get access to the area where the murder was committed? Yeah, I mean, I guess this is kind of like we kind of need to even take a step back and kind of set up this whole DRO system, right? Well, but we have or something about like it that in where, earlier where everybody's episode. got personal insurance, personal insurance or something, right? Yeah. yeah. I, guess, I guess kind of what I was driving at is I've read, um, I'm going to bring up Rothbard again, because he's the one I've read most about a lot of this kind of stuff. But he suggested at one point in one of the articles I read by him that you can apprehend somebody prior to their being convicted, but the people who do the apprehension and hold this person basically run the risk of being charged with crim- kidnapping if the guy's eventually found innocent, you know, like I don't know. some kind of restitution to this guy if it turns out he's not guilty of this crime. Well, I think that it's a possibility if, if you know, I mean, like the guy could be like, yeah, "Hey, you wrongfully kidnapped me, and and I'm suing you," and then they could go to arbitration, and you know, if the if the defense agency or the insurance company can produce enough evidence to show that it really did look like the guy was guilty, then they could probably get off. But if not, uh, if that they doesn't d- sit very well with me. Why? That seems like that's just opening a Pandora's box to um, to basically hold people who are innocent. But I mean, you know, there, like, if there's a preponderance of evidence, I mean, they would be, they would equally be neglect neglecting their responsibility if they didn't arrest somebody who was most likely a murderer. Because oh, so, I mean, it, likewise, if he if they had the evidence, but they didn't arrest him, and then he went out and killed somebody else, you know, they could likewise possibly be sued because they neglected their responsibility and it resulted in, a, in a, another person dying. Yeah, I I don't know. I mean, the guy hasn't it hasn't been proven the guy committed any crime, evidence or, or not. But I, it doesn't. I don't think it matters because I think that in order to you know, to get insurance coverage, and for those of our, our listeners who don't know about this, the basic idea is in a stateless society that everyone will have to take out insurance coverage uh, in order to cover, um, you know, any kind of property or personal damage or crimes or whatever that they might commit uh, to make sure that, you know, all everything, all procedures and everything are locked down ahead of time. And that's shorthand. And if you're like, huh, what, what are you talking about? What's this nonsense? Well, you should go and listen to an earlier episode where we talked about this stuff. But yeah, um, I can find that link if it's not on that page where um, Stefan Molyneux wrote all, wrote all about this. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you know what? It just occurs to me. That's the episode um, titled, Why is John Afraid of a Libertarian Society? If anyone's oh, okay. looking for it. There you that's go. which episode it is. So... Um, <laughs> But I, I think that in order, let's say, you know, this guy is like he, he lives in a city and in order, in order to leave his house, in order to drive his car, in order to get a job, uh, you know, and all this stuff, he has to have insurance coverage. And it makes sense that the insurance company is not going to leave themselves open either. And they're going to be like, in order for you to have insurance, you have to uh, permit us to take you into custody if we have a preponderance of evidence. And uh, you may even have to say that, you know, you hold us, uh, what's, the, what's the phrase, harmless, you know, or... Yeah, hold harmless, yeah. Yeah. 
if we if we screw up or if you know if it turns out you're not guilty. And well, it sounds like you're going to get one of these probable cause hearings before you get arrested kind of thing. Well, I mean, that's how the government does it as well. I mean, well, they arrest you first and haul you in. Yeah. I mean, it sounds to it sounds to me like they basically have to send you some kind of notice and be like, "We're going to, you know, we think you're guilty of this. You can come turn yourself in or else we're going to, you know, go into this arbitration service next week or in three days or whatever. I don't think that's practical though. I think it makes sense for them to take the person into custody and then have the probable cause hearing. Uh, you know, like the way the state does it right now is not completely flawed. I mean, I think it's the outcome of, of centuries of legal, you know, legal development, which before the government got too involved in, it was, was actually pretty, uh, pretty much a free market situation. I think common law is a decent setup. Mm-hmm. Now the government, you know, manages it. It's, it's gamed the system. Um, and it ha- it's added on these things that are really ridiculous. But I think the basics of it are not necessarily bad. Yeah, this see this does, it doesn't sit right with it doesn't sit right with me. I mean, I guess what's what happens when you arrest somebody or some insurance not you but some insurance company arrests somebody and it turns out they're innocent? And is well, there some kind of is there some kind of restitution made for the two or three days you had to sit in a cell while you waited for a judge? Well, like, I mean, like I said, if 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 the person's unhappy about it, they can sue. But um, if if the you know if they sue and then it goes to arbitration and the arbitrator you know decides that or the group panel of arbitrators decides that the that the insurance company had sufficient grounds to believe the person you know had a reasonable belief or whatever well, whatever the standard is that the standard was met then they can say no I'm sorry you know we're, you know it's it's a shame the the insurance company should really make it up to you. But they had every basis for doing what they did, you know, like they acted reasonably. Or if they say, hey, insurance company, you guys screwed up. You didn't, you know, you act, you jumped the gun. You, you know, you didn't have an, you didn't meet the standard, the basic standard of evidence for arresting somebody. And now you go with this guy, you know, $5 million or something. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not on board. I'm taking the radical hard line on this one. But then if you don't, if you, you know, if you're like, if your process is, hey, a potential murderer, we think we're on to you and uh, we'd like you to come to this, we, you know, cordially invite you to our our probable cause hearing. Well, the guy's, the guy, if the guy's guilty, he's probably going to flee. Probably. So this, there's no reason that that uh, this insurance company can't just post somebody outside the guy's house and just basically shadow this guy. Well, that, that's an interesting idea. That's certainly I mean, a possibility. Maybe it's, maybe it's more expensive, but at least it respects the guy's rights. I mean, he's still innocent until proven guilty. I think. I think. I understand what you're saying, and I think it's a quote unquote reasonable setup. But I think that reasonable is not an objective standard, and it's it's just you're going to head down a road to getting to what we've got now. And I think it's it basically opens up the whole thing to abuse. Well, I don't, I don't think there is any objective standard, and I think every system there is no perfect system. There never will be, and every system is going to be subject to abuse, and every well, system guess, but, is going to be subjective too. Yeah, but I think what, what I'm saying, it, but what keeps it what keeps things in harmony is where you don't have a monopoly, where you have things in competition. And so when somebody screws up and takes it too far, they can be put out of business in short order. Yeah, and I agree with you. I just, you know, somebody's rights are going to be violated in that process while you're busy putting that place out of business kind of thing. I, I don't, I don't, not necessarily because if, if, I sign, if I sign a contract saying that I give you permission to, to take me into custody, if you meet this bar of, um, you know, uh, this level of suspicion, you know, evidence-based suspicion, and maybe they even have to take it to a panel of arbitrators or something, just like they do today with warrants. Um, you know, then, you know, then I, my, if they, if they, if, if I sign that, and if they then manage to, to put together that level, you know, reach that level and comply with the process, then they haven't actually violated my rights. Because I gave wow. them permission to do that. 
Well, yeah, if you gave them permission, but I would. But exactly, but they they have to get people. I'm saying the system. It's I don't know how well it's going to work if they don't ask people for that and if people don't give it. You know. Yeah. Then yeah. And my my position is I don't care how well the system works. I think you need to respect people's rights first. Yeah, but you, but you're, I, you, I feel like I know, you're we're tone back deaf. To, we're back I, to the voluntary I, thing. I'm, I, I'm with you on that. Yeah, I mean, I don't. It's they, they're not violating my rights there because I, I signed, I gave them permission to do that. Right. I made well, a trade. And I, I think, said, and I if think you that's cover dangerous... me, if you cover me, and if you permit me to move about in this area and live here with your coverage, then I will give you that permission. I mean, it's a trade like any other. Yeah. I just I on my I think that's a slippery slope. I think that's a dangerous agreement to make. But everything is a slippery slope. I suppose, but I, I, really, I would rather we not start level, down the slope in, in the first place. Well, I mean, I mean we have to live. And I, it's I much agree. more beneficial for us to live in a group. And then when you live in a group, I mean you you reap the benefits, but you also have to be conscious of the compromises that have to be made. Well, I'm going to start the insurance company that when you can, when you're when you're suspected of some crime, we're going to post some guy that just follows you around 24 hours a day. <laughs> but what do you do if the guy escapes? What how if he escapes, escapes uh, how and he escapes? kills my, my bounty loved hunters? One. Are, no, my bounty hunters are on him 24 hours a day. <laughs> but but what if you know what if we're we're in, in the world of Alias, for example, and the guy escapes? And then he comes and he kills my loved one. And I'm like, how did this happen? You guys had this reasonable suspicion. Why didn't you take him into custody? And you're like, well, we were worried about his rights. We, you know. And I'm like, I'm suing your ass. Your insurance company is mine. Well, see, now going back to last week's episode, now I'm with you. I think we bear some responsibility in that situation. Absolutely. So, but so. really, if let's say you have share, stockholders, yeah? And you have okay. your own family to take care of. And you have your employees and their families. And let's say, you know, you have to be like, okay, am I going to take a, you know, am I going to put everybody's future on the line for this guy that I actually have evidence that suggests, strongly suggests that he murdered someone? Am I going to put everybody's future on the line just to let this guy have a few more days of, you know, his normal life and chance and a chance to escape? Well, maybe the more I suspect him, the more bounty hunters I assign to him. But it's, it's not. It's not it's like I wouldn't. I would be like, no, lock that guy up. You know, <laughs> well, because why would I put hundreds of people's futures, possibly thousands or millions, on the line? I for, not for, gonna kill millions of people. He's one guy. Well, you, no, no, you don't he's know not that. Obama. Ha <laughs> <laughs> You don't know that. You don't know that. He may have access to weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> Well, then then the population will put my insurance company out of business in short order. Right. Right after they've been, uh, you know, turned into right they, uh, carbon. Yeah, right after they're zooming dust. into the ground. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we are probably near the, uh, the, the limit for today. Yeah, it seems like we didn't come close to solving the world's ills today. Uh, well, we'll just have to try again next week, I guess. In fact, I think we're going to have to come back to Luke's question because we didn't even get to the trial yet. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, we'll definitely have to continue that next week. All right. Well, All right. thanks, everybody, for listening. And, um, you know, please uh, give us a call. The number is at aymfl.com slash taol. Uh, leave us your question, and you will become an immortal part of the art of liberty. You know what? We need to get, like, some T-shirts make up, made up. I think we talked about this before, but we should put mm. the logo on a T-shirt and send it to people for asking questions. Yes. Brilliant. Brilliant idea. Start up a Zazzle site or something. Yeah, we got to do that. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Thanks, John. Have a great week, George. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, everybody, a special question for our four, perhaps five or six now faithful listeners. No, no, I thought we decided we had like 12. Is it? Is it? I keep forgetting. We got like a bunch of comments when you asked a question last time. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I don't know if they're really faithful listeners or not, though. Oh, okay. So maybe there's only like three or four diehards. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> so uh, John and I are are having a blast doing this, but we're wondering like how much you're enjoying it, right? Right, John? Yes. Sorry. So I thought you were uh, going to say something there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so we're wondering like, do you like the current format? Do you like the topics we're talking about? 
Uh, and, and, you know, do you have any suggestions for what you'd like us to talk about or how you'd like us to structure the podcast? Are we just boring? You want me to try and punch George through the microphone or something? <laughs> oh, ow. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. What do you want? You want more slapstick? You want more serious intellectual stuff? You want more, this is the news for today or, or what, right? Yeah, I want to hear you make that noise more often on these shows. <laughs> <laughs> Breaking news. <laughs> Breaking news today in, I don't know, I give up. I need to All prepare right. for comedy. I'm not very good at it. <laughs> so anyway, well, at dear least we're listeners, making ourselves laugh. Yeah. Dear listeners. Please give us some feedback, and thanks for listening. You don't even have to call. You could do this via any means you want. The, the Facebook Art of Liberty page is probably the best way. By any means necessary. Yeah. <laughs> Terminator style. Yeah, or Malcolm X, depending on your preference. All right. <laughs> <laughs>